Glen Ely High School, or should I say residential roots, is well and truly in business, I thought it was about time I bought the history of my house from them. Ah, oh, hello. Um, is the history of my house that I ordered ready yet, please? Oh, yes, that's very nice, very well prepared indeed. Beautiful photographs, too. Well, how much do I owe you for that, then? Three pound and one pence, please. Three pound and one penny. So it's, that's a little bit more than I expected to pay. Are you making an absolute fortune on each one of these? Not really. How much do you make on each one? Thirty pence. Thirty pence? I see. Wait a minute, though. Your computer seems to say something about twenty-seven pounds or thirty pounds. Yes, but you have to go and see Kevin in accounts for that. Go and see Kevin in accounts for an explanation. Well, I think I will, if you don't mind. I'll leave you the money there. Let's see what Kevin has to say. Right then, Kevin. Your colleague in the sales department has um, told me that you're not making very much money on these histories of the house, and I wanted some convincing and he said you were the person to do so. So can you explain how much it is costing you to make these? This is a spreadsheet which we got it all down mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And the paper costs two pence a sheet. And we need ten sheets of paper. That's in here I've got yeah. ten pages, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we cost twenty pence. Mm -hmm. And then covers cost ten pence each, which we need one of, Ooh. so that's ten pence. And then binders two pence each, which we need one of. Mm -hmm. So that'll all come to thirty two pence. So that's 32 pence just for the actual bits of paper yes. in here. Yes, okay. What other costs have you got then? Then we got the visit to Birmingham. To that see. was when you went to the advertising yes. agency. Mm -hmm. That's 87 pound 40. A lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then the advert to advertise the program. Mm -hmm. That's 150 pound. Yes. And then the hidden charges, which would be telephone charges. Uh, and electricity. The school have been mean enough to charge you electricity, at least. Yes. Quite right, too, actually. And then we spread the cost of the three things over a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the price, yes. the actual cost yes. per book. Yes. And what's this number now, then? That's um, the 241.9. Add it on to the 32 there. So your total costs are 273 pence or yes. thereabouts for each yes. one, right? So you had a 10% profit, yes. £27.9. Right. And the price then would be three pound more pence. Which is what I was asked to pay. Yes. All right, well, you, I think you've convinced me that you, it's not a rip-off and that it is a fair price. Let me ask you this question now, then. Supposing the price of paper doubled, what difference would that make to how much you'd have to charge me? It's easy, just recalculate it. Uh-huh. Now, the price of what was the price of paper? It was 2p a sheet, wasn't it? Suppose it went up to 4p a sheet, what would happen? Oh, and it's recalculated the lot. Right, let's go down to the bottom then and see how much you'd have to charge. So instead of three pounds and a penny, you'd have to charge three pounds. Gosh, so it's a big increase. Yes. Okay, well, thanks very much. I think you've convinced me that you're not really ripping me off after all. In a real business, keeping the accounts under control is just one of the most important uses of computers. Perhaps the other important use is in helping you to make the products you've got to sell. At Cadbury's Chocolate Factory in Birmingham, computers are used to control almost every aspect of chocolate making. With a box of chocolates containing many different types, and because customers have their particular favourites which they expect to find in a box, making sure a packet is of the correct weight is a job for one of the computers. At Cadbury's, each production line is supervised from a line manager's computer like this one. At Capital Windows in Cardiff, the computer is given the size of each window to be made and then controls the machines which actually construct the windows. Well, from computers being used to help make products 
to a product which uses a computer to help it work. You remember we were looking at devices to help you get mud off your shoes. Well, here's one. It's called the Spring Cleaner. And to tell me all about it is Richard. How does it work, Richard? Well, first of all, you get your shoe, and then you switch it on, and it goes round, and then it stops again for you to change your shoes. And then when it's finished, you just take your shoes off, and they should be nice and clean again. Great stuff. Well, let's have a practical demonstration, then. Can you turn it on for me? And where does all the mud go? The mud goes in this box down the bottom. There's a box down the bottom, and the mud collects in there. OK. Well, before you show me inside it and how it works inside, I know this wasn't the first idea that you no. all came up with, was it? There were no. lots of earlier attempts. Yes. In fact, the whole class had been working on machines to get mud off your shoes. Now then, Helen, this was the first one of the drawings where you decided to make it into a machine, wasn't it? Yes. Um, and I know there were problems with it, but first of all, just show me that it really does work. Can you wire it up? Right, OK, well, it does make quite a bit of noise, so just turn it off. Thank you. Now, where would the shoe go, then? Um, well, the shoe would go on top of the brush, yeah. and it would, um, we thought it, um, it wasn't a very good idea, because when the shoe would go like that, and would go with it, and it would get tired of putting your foot up. Right, so you just have to hold your foot in the middle of the air. Yes. Right, and what happened to the mud, then? The mud went flying everywhere, all over your legs and your, um, trousers. And Gareth, tell me how your shoe cleaner works, then. Well, you turn those handles, it should turn that chain and it turns the wheel there, it turns those brushes there. Well then, Richard, we come back to you. This is the, the framework which you've covered so nicely. I yes. see it's still got the motor and all the yes. mechanism. Where'd you get this brush thing from? It was from a hairbrush that we took apart. Mm -hmm. That's a good and idea. Slid it on. Right, and then you decided to control the whole thing instead of turning it on and off yourselves, but to control it by computer. Yes. So perhaps you could tell me about the computer programme, could you? Well, first of all, we put the name of the programme, which was 2B. We called our programme B, because B standard for British. And then we put repeat 2, because obviously you had two shoes to clean. So we wanted it to repeat two times. Then you put 2 turn on, and how long you wanted to wait. And we put 5 hundredths of a second, which is 5 seconds. And then we put turn off, and when we wanted to wait 300, so that means three seconds. And then we just ended the programme. Well, run the machine again for us, will you now? from making machines to making the history of someone's house. Computers can help not just in gathering all the necessary information, but also by making it possible to display all the information in a professional-looking format. Alan, Joanne, you're running the database part of this history factory. What's all the stuff you've got here? There's information on um, Cathedral Road. Some 1881. There's 1883 and 1886. And you've got all this in the computer? Yeah. That looks like a lot of work to me. Is this a complete print of all the history entries you've got in the computer? Yeah. Right, and what are you doing just now? I'm finding out information on the surname Jones, how many people in Cathedral Road got the surname Jones. OK, well, let's, let's do that then, can we? Is the same as Jones. There should be plenty of those as being Wales. It's five out of 112. Can we have a look at one of them? Okay, there's one. Now tell me what all that means then. He's from Cardiff. His address is Brintower. He's William Jones. Mm -hmm. He's the head. He's unmarried. He's a male. He's 29. 
There's three people in his family. He's a printer and he was born in Newport. And by using this, then, you can keep records of who lived in what house and for how long they lived there, can you? Yeah. And you pass that on to the next people in the factory, do you? Yes. OK, well, I think I'll go and talk to them now, then. Now then, Rachel, what are you doing with the information that uh, Joanna supplied to you? Taking the information off Joanne, putting it in the computer and printing it out for the page makers so they can print it out on the machine. Mm -hmm. Show me what you've got there then. Those are the people who lived in Grand Town Villa in 1875 till 1972. In 1875, Thomas Mogus lived in Grand Town Villa. 1882, William Jones moved in. Now that's the William Jones that I saw Joanne getting out of the database? Yeah. yeah. It's astonishing you can get all that information out of the database. Yes. yes. And now you're going to pass that to the next stage of the process, and I think I'll go along there and see what they're up to. Right, let's see what Jane's up to. What have you got here, then, Jane? It's a sheet with all different dresses different people who lived in Cathedral Road in 1881. This is a printout from, um, from Joanne's database, yeah. isn't it? But you've made it all into a nice description of what happens. How have you done that? Just combining the pieces together, making sense out of them, and then putting it up to an interesting way, mm. way so somebody can read them without mm. being bored. Mm. Well, sh show me what you've got there, then. Well, James was the head of the household of Tramway House in 1881. He was married to Mary. He was an ostler who was born in Hereford. He was 43 years of age. His wife Mary was 45. She didn't do anything for a living. She was born in Hereford. James and Mary had four sons. Their names were Alfred, Arthur, Charles and Albert. Now, I saw that, and you, yeah. you've had to combine four different entries from the database to work that out, haven't you? Yeah. Mm. Their oldest son was 14. He was an apprentice. He was born in Hereford as well. OK, well, I'll, I'll go and see now what they're doing in the next part of the process. Right, now then, Kerry and Katerina, what's your job in the history of your house factory? Well, we take the information off Jane or Rachel and we see how we can place it on a sheet to make it look nice. OK, well, let's see you do that then. Well, I'm taking the title and um, placing it up the top. Residential Roots, that's yeah. the name of your company? Yeah. I'll take the first paragraph of writing and place it in the first column. And then the second paragraph of writing, place in the second column. Can we see the writing now, then? OK, well, can we have a printout of that, then, please? to the fire. Okay, here it comes. And there it is on the printer. Perhaps, Katerina, you could pass the paper to us, could you? Yes, it looks good. Um, bit of work to do. It's a bit untidy around there still, isn't it? OK, well, uh, I think it's going to look really nice when you've finished it, and I'll leave you to get on with the job. In this series, we've shown that you can base a business on selling almost anything, even the history of someone's house well, the next step is up to you. You're a fully-fledged member of the micro class by now, so take your school computer and get your business going. But remember, you'll be doing just the same as the rest of British industry. And also remember that when it comes to the profits, my share's 10%. Goodbye. <laughs>